Greetings one and all. Today's session starts another new unit, this time on the scientific revolution and the age of reason. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is going to be some of the new groundbreaking ideas in science that really get the ball rolling on this entire time period, a period of time really that we're looking at probably that ranges from, you know, end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s, all the way through the uh, 1600s. So it's the age of science and reason a scientific revolution. So let's get specific. What are the essential questions we're looking at today? Well, as we begin, we'll kind of look at science and the church. What's the relationship that the two have? What is the Catholic Church's view on science and the universe, and how are those views going to impact science and those who study it in the future? And then we'll get into some of the new scientific ideas. What are the new scientific ideas that are being introduced by some of the great minds of this era? Why are these ideas groundbreaking and in some cases, as we'll see, extremely dangerous? And how will these ideas impact the future of science and other areas of thought? Now we're going to focus in on just four individuals, and that, that is not to say that these are the only four people doing anything during this time, but we're just picking out these four uh, because of the greater impact that they're having. The four that we'll look at are Nicholas Copernicus, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and of course the granddaddy of them all, Sir Isaac Newton. All right, so let's start with science and the church. And, you know, can you put science and church really in the same sentence here without the word not in the middle of it? Uh, look, let's go back. Middle Ages, okay? After the fall of Rome, we lose a lot of the knowledge. We lose a lot of that education. And so the idea of science is pretty much non-existent in the Middle Ages. Things like magic and mysticism rule scientific thought. Anything that you could not explain immediately had to be governed and, and understood only through superstition. And anything having to do with superstition or stuff you didn't understand and that was the church's field, okay? Uh, so people deferred to the church on, on matters of anything they didn't understand. And so it was during this time period that the church taught things like the earth was flat and that the earth was the center of the universe. Uh, this was the line that the church taught, and, and people believed it because they trusted uh, in the church during this time. And, and the church put this out there uh, because their thought process was that, you know, God created the earth and God created man and God created the universe. And since man was created on God's earth in God's image, then everything else mu must be out there to serve man and must therefore revolve around man. And this is called the geocentric theory, the idea that the earth is the center of the universe. And the church did not invent this idea. The uh, astronomer Ptolemy uh, years and years and years and years and years earlier had put this out there and the church was still kind of hanging on to all of that. Uh, now, that being said, okay, keep in mind how dangerous it's going to be to go against the teachings of the church. Keep in mind how dangerous it's going to be if you're a scientist and you discover something that could perhaps prove this to be wrong. You're looking at a lot of trouble for yourself. You're looking at being branded as a heretic. You're potentially looking at a date with the Inquisition. So science could be a very dangerous endeavor to your life and limb during this time. And so let's look at the first of these really influential scientists. It's a guy by the name of Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish astronomer working at the University of Krakow in the late 1400s. And let's consider the time period here, all right? It's the era of the Renaissance, okay? We've got new knowledge. Uh, we've got people looking at the world in a totally different way. You know, we have the ideas of secularism and humanism causing people to examine the world as it is, thinking less about the afterlife and more about this earth and this life. And so this is causing them to examine things they maybe hadn't examined before and look at them in a way they hadn't looked at them before. And so Copernicus, through his own uh, observations, comes to believe that the earth is round. Now, Again, it needs to be said that this was not a new idea. By this period of time, pretty much every educated person believed that the Earth was round, so that's not revolutionary. But what is kind of revolutionary here is the fact that Copernicus believed that the Earth was not the center of the universe but instead it was the sun that sat at the center of the universe. He believed that the sun was at the center and that the Earth revolved around the sun, and that as it revolved around the sun, it spun or rotated on an axis. This is what gave the false illusion that the sun was moving around the earth, when in reality, he thinks, it is the earth moving around the sun. This is what is called the heliocentric theory, or heliocentric model, sun-centered model of the universe. Now, this is a really dangerous idea. Why? Because it goes against the teachings of the church. Remember, the church says that the earth is the center of the universe, and Copernicus believes the sun is the center of the universe. So making these kind of ideas public can get you into big trouble. It could lead to persecution. 
You could be branded a heretic, you could be excommunicated, or you could face icky torture and death at the hands of the Inquisition. So it's pretty messy, dangerous stuff. And as a result, Copernicus works in privacy for 30 years, does not publish his ideas, and it is only right before his death that his friends finally make his work public and publish it, of course, under his name, because from beyond the grave, not even the Inquisition can get to you. And so the cat is out of the bag, and people across Europe uh, begin reading these ideas, and they're exposed this heliocentric model. And these ideas are going to influence scientists, astronomers, and other thinkers generations now into the future. And one of those people that's influenced by Copernicus's work is a German astronomer by the name of Johannes Kepler. He, too, will develop hypotheses that will challenge the teachings of the church uh, in the early 1600s. But here's the difference. Kepler's German, right? And by this time, people in Germany are Protestant. And so as a Protestant, Kepler does not have to worry about persecution by the church for the work that he is publishing. The Protestant church uh, does not care about uh, things that might prove the Catholic church wrong. Heck, they like stuff that proves the Catholic church wrong. So Copernic- uh, not Copernicus, but Kepler's ideas are very widely published and very well known. So Kepler's going to use math, which is, I'm sure, everyone's second favorite subject behind history, of course, but he's going to use math to try to prove some of what Copernicus said is true, and he's going to disprove some of what Copernicus said. Kepler's going to use math to prove that he thinks, indeed, the sun does sit at the center of the universe and the planets move around the sun. But Copernicus argued that the planets moved in perfect circles. Kepler, however, using his awesome math skills, will prove that the planets do not move in perfect circles, but instead move in oval paths called ellipses around the sun. And he's also going to prove something that he really can't explain. And that's the fact that the planets uh, don't move at the same speed, but instead move faster when they're closer to the sun. He can't really explain why, but he can tell through observation and through mathematics that the planets, as they're closer to the sun, move faster. Planets that, are, that have orbits closer to the sun have faster orbits, and planets themselves, when they get closer to the sun, move faster. He can't really explain why, but he knows, based on his observations and his mathematics, that in these elliptical patterns, they move faster. He just doesn't know exactly how to explain it. Now, the next person here, Galileo Galilei, is working roughly around the same time as Kepler. I mean, they're generally speaking here. Um, and he's going to make scientific discoveries that will challenge the, ter- uh, the church. The difference here is that Galileo is Italian. He lives in Italy, and he's a Catholic. So his ideas, being published as they will, are going to get him into big trouble. So in the early 1600s, in 1609, Galileo built a telescope. And through this telescope, he observes moons revolving around the planet Jupiter. This is huge. Why is this huge? Because the Catholic Church said that all heavenly bodies revolve around Earth. Well, these moons don't revolve around Earth. They revolve around Jupiter. So what does this mean? From this observation, Galileo reasons that if indeed moons can revolve around Jupiter, that means not everything revolves around the Earth. And if not everything revolves around the Earth, it is very possible that the heliocentric model could be correct. That if indeed not all things revolve around the Earth, it's really possible that everything could be revolving around the Sun. And so he publishes this work, and it is read, and uh, originally, you know, no one makes too big of a deal out of it until the church gets a hold of it, right? These ideas that he published in his work were counter to the doctrine of the church. Uh, And once the popes, uh, you know, got wind of these things, uh, they were believed to be incredibly dangerous. As a matter of fact, the pope at the time, Pope Urban VIII, argued that the writings of Galileo were even more dangerous than those of Martin Luther. And we can remember what happened with Martin Luther. That was the whole Protestant Reformation thing. Uh, And so to say that the work of Galileo is more dangerous than Martin Luther is really, really saying something here. And so in 1632, the Catholic Church banned Galileo's work as heretical, and the Pope demanded that Galileo come to Rome and stand trial before the Inquisition. And we have to understand why the Church is is so fearful of these ideas. Think about it. The Church has taught, and people believed, that the Earth is the center of the universe. But what if they can be proven wrong? What if they can be proven that the Earth is not the center of the universe, that what they're telling people is not correct? What would happen then to the believers? Would people say, my goodness, the church was wrong about this. What else could they be wrong about? 
And this changes the entire religious and philosophical and social landscape of Europe. The church is only as strong as there are people who believe in them, and this could dent their credibility uh, and cause people not to follow them as much, and the church thus loses their power. So indeed, this could be considered more dangerous than the writings of Martin Luther. And so here is Galileo standing trial before the Inquisition. And uh, he gets the normal Inquisition treatment. He is threatened with uh, things like torture. He's threatened with being burned. He's threatened with possible death. That kind of goes along with being burned. And so under these threats of torture and death, he ultimately agrees to recant or take back his statements. Now, does he really believe he was wrong? Probably not, but to save his own skin, he goes along with the demands of the Inquisition and ultimately publicly states, hey, I was wrong, I didn't really see moons revolving around Jupiter, I don't know what I saw, but I'm wrong and the church is right. Now, do people really believe his statement? Probably not, because again, his work was already published, it was being widely read, and I can't imagine that too many people would have believed his rather flaccid uh, recantation of his originally published ideas. Uh, nonetheless, he spends the rest of his life now under house arrest while his ideas float around freely, influencing other people in Europe. All right, last guy we want to hit today, and probably the most important out of all of them, is one Sir Isaac Newton out of England. Now, Isaac Newton, his work is kind of the culmination of all the work of those who came before him. Isaac Newton explains and expands upon the work of Copernicus, of Galileo, and Kepler in his very famous book, Principia. And among other things, from within this book comes Newton's very famous theory, the theory of universal gravitation, or as we call it, the theory of gravity. And this is to explain the stuff that the other guys could not figure out. It explains why the planets move the way they do. It explains how uh, uh, the, the universe or the solar system is held in order by this invisible force gravity. Newton demonstrates how gravity prevents objects from flying off into space and revolving Earth, how it holds the solar system together while keeping the sun and the planets in all of their proper orbits. And, and being that I am not a science guy, I cannot begin to fully explain how all of it works, so I'm not going to even try. Uh, leave that to your science teachers and your science classes. But uh, I will say this for Isaac Newton. Uh, the man was such an incredible genius that to prove his own theories, he invented a new branch of mathematics called calculus. So not only is the guy an incredible genius uh, coming up with these theories of universal gravitation, he even invents a new form of math to prove his theories as being true. Uh, and the stuff that he puts forward in this book is going to change the world in more ways than one. It's not going to just change the way that people look at the universe from a scientific perspective, but the work of Isaac Newton suggests to people on a much larger level that precise mathematic formulas can be used to describe an orderly world, an orderly universe. It's not just willy-nilly crazy stuff out there, but we can understand it. And so Newton's work and these suggestions influence philosophers in many other fields, and they come to believe that if we can understand the great mysteries of the wider universe using logic and reason, then what else can we understand about the world if we apply logic and reason? What could we understand about nature? What could we understand about economics? What could we understand about politics and society if we just applied logic and reason? And so Newton and his work, which is based on a lot of the work of people who came before him, is going to influence a great many other philosophers deep into the future. All right, well, there we have it for today, guys. We looked at science and its kind of iffy relationship with the church, how the church would really, as we could see, actively work to suppress science that went against its own teachings. And then we looked at new scientific ideas that were introduced by some of these groundbreaking individuals like Copernicus, like Kepler, like Galileo, uh, and then, of course, one Isaac Newton. So, guys, those are the essential questions. Make sure that you study those and be ready to talk about them the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.